Chapter 5 opens on the eve of the 2008 presidential election and the mirage of hope its results created about the U.S. But it worried a Republican Party that was aware of how much of the white vote Obama had also secured, more than the previous Democratic white candidate John Kerry, and the overall turnout rate of black voters virtually equaled that of white voters for the first time in history. The voting tides appeared to be turning in favor of the Democratic Party, and it was worrisome that this became most obvious with the election of a black man, with an 8.5 million margin in his victory. And this was an overall younger voting group with lower socioeconomic standing, which made them favor more public, federal, programming, and funding. The Republican Party feared losing clout offices and setting the status quo. And instead of re-examining the party, the GOP settled on accepting that people of color would never widely vote Republican, so they focused on a different approach, disenfranchisement. The narrative was spun to be about protecting against voter fraud. But the truth was, as conservative activist Paul Weyrich put it, the GOP's leverage in the elections goes up as the voting populace goes down. Soon, voter ID laws popped up in multiple states, making it more difficult for black people to vote. The Southern strategy now tied the Democratic Party to corruption and voter fraud. Obama did not win the election based on strategy but stole it via illicitly registered new voters. The Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, or ACORN for short, was at the center of the controversy even though no evidence was ever found. Still, the controversy continued into finding new ways to intimidate specific populations away from voting across multiple states, specifically those populations that helped put a black man in the White House. One of the main examples came in the form of voter ID laws that required government-issued IDs. Such laws left millions of voters ineligible. And while such laws also affected white people, they disproportionately affected black and Latine people. Another tactic was scaling back early voting and the number of polling locations. But the most far-reaching attack was in the 2013 Vetting of the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court. An additional voter suppression tactic was making government as an entity so frustrating that the average person did not want to or would not bother to vote. The Republican Congress sacrificed itself. As public approval of Congress fell to single digits, voter turnout for the 2014 midterm elections also dropped to its lowest numbers since 1942. As Anderson puts it, so many of those who had been mobilized and energized in 2008 were now disillusioned, demoralized, and, in many cases, disenfranchised, and most simply stayed home. Anderson then turns to disgusting the country that President Obama inherited, one in the midst of financial crisis. And though Obama, as a centrist, should have worked well with Republicans, he instead had over an 85% disapproval rating among them. And during his first year in office, there was a 400% increase in death threats. During his first election campaign, Republican candidate McCain's strategist called Obama everything. Socialist, Muslim, Arab, foreign, a black nationalist, and more. And Republican congresspeople continued to blatantly disrespect him throughout his presidency. They wanted to spin a narrative of Obama hating the U.S. And this narrative led to many white individuals taking radical approaches to taking back their country, one infamous example being Dylan Roof and the massacre he carried out at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. You're taking over our country, he said, and he knew this to be true. In 1935, Langston Hughes, one of the premier Harlem Renaissance poets, wrote the poem, Let America Be America Again. The poem is an indictment on the fallacy of the American dream and how the promises of freedom and equality for all have never come to fruition for the vast majority, especially those systemically marginalized because of their color and or financial standing. If you've never read the poem, 
Hughes gets his points across by starting the poem with stanzas about the hopes and dreams of the American experiment, its expectation of being a land defined by opportunity, freedom, and patriotic prosperity. But then he punctuates each of these stanzas with reminders that this was never his version America. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. He then transitions to what the experience has been as a person not included in America's promise. Poor white people, Native Americans, immigrants, and African Americans. Hughes is trying to make a point that all of these individuals should be aligned around the sentiment of the failure of the American promise if it was intended to apply to all. And in that, I saw the Obama presidency as outlined by Anderson. The promised America is in many ways what led to the election of Obama, but it is also what led to the white rage that accompanied his presidency. People who have been racially and economically marginalized by the country banded together for a man who promised to bring about and represented the actual promise of America. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane seeking a home where he himself is free. And with the election, it seemed the promise was en route to fulfillment. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. But. That air of equality is what triggered the backlash. Conservatives, Republicans, and their allied alleged non-racists wanted a return to the America that Langston Hughes described as the unfulfilled promise, the land that never has been yet. The Obama hatred was deeply connected to seeing a man who may be able to create the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America. So, what was the response? To ensure that that America would never be, and that the refrain of Hughes, that America never was America to me, would return as the sentiment for those responsible for the Obama victory. And in watching how President Obama was treated, how could black people in America feel that this country would ever be theirs in the way that white conservatives do? After seeing the insults, political disrespect, death threats, and rise of the Dylan Roofs, the subjugated and disenfranchised were reminded that America never was America to me. But the fact that Obama happened, that that level of black achievement was reached, still leaves the glimmer of hope that the promised America that black Americans and their allies felt on election night, that America will be, hopefully, 